Hello, welcome to Us Wargamer. I'm your host, Rob, and if you're excited for the forces of chaos, then this is going to be the army review for you. We will be reviewing all of the Slaves to Darkness units. We're going to be looking at how they work, how they integrate, and the combinations, and whether or not we think they're useful, and what those units are probably going to do in your army. This is the first of several videos that I am going to make about Slaves of Darkness or any of the armies and you'll be able to check those out in the future where we'll do tier lists of the units, we'll review the points and we'll start talking about units being good or bad based on how many points they cost because Archeon at 2,000 points isn't as good as Archeon at 10 points. And then we'll be making loads more videos so I hope you'll join me on this journey to review this army and also review all the other armies and do all the rest of the content. And yeah, I just hope you enjoy it. So if you are going to like it, like, subscribe, leave a comment, let me know what you think about the different units and how they work. I'm recording this while I'm talking with a Twitch chat, so we're going to do this kind of gestalt conversation. If you ever want to join me on the Oswego Gamer Twitch, where we have these big long conversations, it's super good. Uh, now let's dive straight in and start looking at the battle traits. The first thing that we're going to talk about are your army special rules. These are your battle traits, and these are going to apply to most of your units in your army, and it's your way of playing. Uh, like it's, it's basically kind of the narrative way that your army plays. And it's pretty cool, really, but you're mainly focused on killing units if you want to use half of the allegiance, and the other half you pick at the start of the game. So this is, in my opinion, an incredibly great suite of of allegiance abilities. So the first one we'll talk about is the passive Mark of Chaos that's on the right-hand side of the screen here. And what this does is at the start of the battle, uh, like you will choose, um, for instance, like, sorry, when you're writing your list, sorry, when you're writing your list, you'll choose which Mark of Chaos your units will have if they can choose a Mark of Chaos. That's important, okay? If you choose Undivided, and you don't have to have all of them be the same Mark of Chaos, so you can have one Corn unit, one Nurgle unit. Uh, so obviously you can have an army with a lot of variety, and you can really play into the strengths of certain units or increase uh, or, you know, strengthen a weakness of those units. Okay, Undivided, you add one to Wound Rolls for the unit's combat attacks that target a hero or monster. Because I think this might be a centerpiece edition where we see lots of big monsters and heroes, that could be really, really good. But that's going to uh, be more beneficial on you, on uh, models and units that have more attacks compared to corn, where if it's got the corn keyword, you add one to the attacks characteristic of this unit's melee weapons for the rest of the turn on a turn in which it charged. So ongoing battles will be a problem. And, and normally Slaves of Darkness units, for instance, Chosen or Knights, have really good armor saves. So they're what I would call a bruiser unit, where they're able to stay in continual combats for a long time. That means you're going to lose this buff. But on a turn in which you do charge, you're going to do a lot more or you're do a lot more attacks, and therefore, in my opinion, a lot more damage. That's probably, in my opinion, the better one. Zinch. Uh, if you give them the mark, has it a 4 plus ward save against mortal damage inflicted by spell abilities and used by manifestations. So the manifestations we've seen so far have done some okay damage, but not anything that I'm too concerned about. In addition, the mortal wound damage from spells has seemed a little lackluster so far as well. If there has been someone that's been able to do a lot of mortal damage like we've seen with Nagash, it has to be on multiple different units. So a 4 at ward save, which is only going to reduce that by half, I'm not sure. Uh, Nurgle is obviously incredibly good. You subtract one from wound rolls or combat attacks that target that unit. I mean, obviously this is already going to be a block of Cornate Warriors, more than likely. Uh, because no, Sorry, not Cornate Warriors, a block of uh, Chaos Warriors. Because they've got a great armor save then you're going to make them minus one to wound. They're going to be great for holding an objective. And then Sinesh is add one to run rolls and charge rolls to the unit. You might build an incredibly fast cavalry force. Sometimes you want one unit to be fast, but maybe you want the entire army to be fast. And in that case, Sinesh might be really beneficial. So those are the uh, marks of chaos that they have. If a unit with a mark of chaos keyword is replaced, the replacement unit has the same mark of chaos keyword. Okay, so if you end up recycling a unit back from the dead, then it has to recycle with the same keyword. Okay, the other allegiance ability you have is used once per turn at the end of any turn. Each friendly Slaves to Darkness unit that destroyed an enemy unit this turn can be the target. So, at the end of every turn, you get to check if any of your units have killed something. So, you're going to want to kill stuff because you're going to want to destroy units. Because each, each friendly Slaves to Darkness unit that destroyed an enemy unit this turn is a target. And it does not affect friendly beasts or non-hero monsters. So hero monsters, yes, but non-hero monsters, no, cannot be targeted. What you do is you roll a d6, and there is a result that you can apply to your unit. 
if it's a one, which is no effect, you do you can re-roll it. I mean, you can re-roll it if it's any of the results because you might want to re-roll it. However, if you do re-roll it and you roll a one, you're going to take D3 mortal damage on the unit. So, you know, in order to get these buffs, you are going to have to kill units, and there are going to only be so many units on the board. That's something to think about. Also, it means that beasts and non-hero monsters are probably going to feature less in lists straight away because they can't benefit from this. So the first one is snubbed by the gods, which has no effect. The second one is mutative growth, where you heal three to the target. And honestly, that's not bad. If you end up rolling that on a big hero monster like Archeon, you heal three, you'll be happy with that. Unnatural graces add one to hit rolls, so the targets combat attacks to the rest of the battle, which is legit good as well. Lurid Aura, where the target has a ward of six plus for the rest of the battle. And if it already has a ward of six plus, it has a five up ward save. Rob, do these stack? Yes. If I have some Chaos Warriors, they go in, they kill a unit, they get the six up ward save, and then I fight again, kill another unit. Will they get a five up ward save? They absolutely will, which is crazy good in my opinion. Slaughterer's Might, where you add one to the rend characteristic of the target's melee weapons for the rest of the battle, can be crazy good, especially on units that are maybe going to charge, counter charge, like knights. So charge in, kill a screen, get plus one rend, charge again. Uh, that's really good. And if you're on a six, you can pick any other effect. So there's loads of good things there. It does say the same effect can be applied multiple times to a unit and more than one effect can apply to you at the same time. I would be really happy with these battle traits if I was a safety darkness player. Specifically but because Games Workshop doesn't really ever understand uh, economies of scale and plus one attacks is like, oh, plus one attacks on all of like this five-man unit. And then you're like, you take that unit up to 20 and you're getting plus 20 attacks. It becomes nutty. Uh, or, you know... It's add one to the attack characteristics of the unit's melee weapons for the rest of the turn. So that means if you have a mounted unit like uh, Knights or Varangard, both of them are going to benefit from as well, which is obviously really great. So uh, yeah, great battle traits. In your Slaves of Darkness Force, you can also take a free terrain feature. Obviously, you've got to buy it. Uh, but what I mean by free is it doesn't cost you any points, like you'll see with a Loon Shrine or any of the other terrain features you have for the other factions. This is the first time that these Slaves to Darkness have had this and uh, did not have this in 3rd edition. So the Nexus Chaotica, what does it do? Well, it's got 12 health and a 4-up save. And if you are an already existing Slaves to Darkness player, you don't have to stress too much about picking it up because the effects that it have are nominal. However, if you are playing against a Slaves to Darkness player, they are going to use this pretty massive piece of terrain to do what we call move blocking. So effectively, because you see it's got the impassable keyword there, they're going to create a dead zone where your opponent is going to be able to get past you, which is super frustrating and annoying because Games Workshop, again, doesn't understand how that works. But we're going to go past that. What, do you, what does it do? Okay, well, first up, in your hero phase, you draw power. So your hero phase, roll a d6, and then you give that number of power points to the terrain feature. The terrain feature can have a maximum of 12 power points. Super simple. Draw, roll the dice, get six. In your hero phase, you can use up three of those power points and you can pick a friendly safe to darkness, darkness wizard within three inches and you can have plus one to casting rolls for that target for the rest of the turn. What's really nice about that is if you do have a multi-level caster, as in like a level two caster or a level three caster, I don't think you'll have that, but still. If you have a level two caster, that means plus one to cast on all those spells, which we love. That's really nice. And then, especially because there's going to be loads of, uh, you're going to be doing loads of manifestations and spells and stuff. And then... In your hero phase, it, you can do Corrupt the Realms, where if this terrain feature has nine or more power points, you can pick an objective or terrain feature within 24 inches of this terrain, then pick any number of units within three inches of that target, and then you use up nine power points, and then you roll a D3, and for each two plus, you'll do that many mortal wounds. You'll either do two or three mortal wounds to everything within three inches of a terrain feature or objective within 24 inches. That's not bad. That's not bad. And plus one to cast is honestly very good. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sniff at it. And in the right situation, being able to do an AoE mortal wound splash is lovely. But like, do you feel like it's necessary? No. What I mean by that is if you look at, say, Gloomspike Gits, where they have a return models from the dead mechanic built into their Loon Shrine, you have to get that. You have to use that for your army to be more viable. In this, this is just a lovely bonus that you have for army, which is nice to see. Uh, it's also, uh, I should have mentioned, it's got 12 health and a 4-up save because terrain is destroyable. And once it's destroyed, you won't be able to put any more back on the board. So uh, that is how terrain works. So you don't necessarily have to worry about defending it. It's going to give you some okay bonuses. Not bad.
When you write your army list, one of your heroes, and it doesn't have to be your general, can take a heroic trait. There are three to choose from for Safe Darkness. The first one is Favor of the Pantheon, where this unit can use the Eye of the Gods ability as if it were the end of the turn and it destroyed an enemy unit this turn. That's pretty nice, especially if you have a large hero that's going to do a lot of attacks, because obviously most of them are attack based. Uh, plus one to hit, you know, plus rend uh, as an example. Uh, so not too bad. Next one feels like it's getting a little bit better, where it's once per battle in any combat phase, this unit. Unit can use two fire abilities this phase after the first is used. However, the unit has strike last for the rest of the turn. Also makes a lot of sense um, and feels even better because you get this once per battle ability to just fight twice and smash something. Feels very good, but it gets better the bigger and more fighty a unit is. So rubbish on a Chaos Lord on foot and obviously incredible on like, you know, um, uh, like a larger, like a Demon Prince or something like that. Uh, but then we have, um, it feels like the auto pick is en in any hero phase, you can do Radiance of the Dark Glory, which is, by the way, every hero phase. You pick each damaged friendly unit holier than 12 inches of this unit to be the target. You roll a dice for each target. On a three plus, you can heal one to the target. If the unit is a monster, you can heal three. This is, this is massively important for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, it's obviously always going to be in range of itself. So it's going to heal itself. Number two, it's going to obviously be really, really good into multiple units in your army every hero phase. So it scales much better than the other two abilities. Number three, we're seeing quite a lot of abilities like the Nurgle mechanic as an example, where what it does is it makes it so you can't heal. Being able to persistently take off any of the Nurgle disease points or the burning from Zinch or any of those abilities which stop you doing healing is going to be able to continuously shut down one of their main ways of working and you can persistently do it which is very aggressive in my personal opinion uh, so this is just an auto pick this might be one of the strongest heroic traits we've seen so far I should point out, because I have asked, been, been asked this question, when you do take heroic traits, uh, those heroic traits are only usable on non-unique units. So you couldn't have that ability on Archeon. Also on your army list, you are going to give, also on your army list, you're going to give one of your heroes a artifact of power. And there are three to choose from. The first one is used once per battle at the start of any turn. And it's called the Infernal Puppet. And you definitely should do it at the start of your opponent's turn. You pick a visible enemy wizard within 24 inches of this unit to be the target. For the rest of the turn, each time the target is picked to use a spell ability, you inflict D3 mortal damage. And then eventually, if you end up killing that hero, then the spell ability that's trying to use that turn is not resolved. Obviously, this is super good if you go up against Nagash. Tries to cast nine spells, could take 93 mortal damage. Obviously, the enemy is not silly enough that they're just going to keep taking D3 mortal wounds off you. So what it really does is it shuts down a magic phase for a turn which I think is pretty nice, especially when we get into the units that we have later in this book where we're going to have things like Bellacore who are also going to shut down enemy units as well. So having an additional thing that's going to shut down magic feels very strong. Even a one-cast wizard isn't going to potentially want to take D3 mortal damage in the right situation. So yeah, Infernal Puppet is great. The next one is a passive, and it's the Conqueror's Crown, where you subtract five from the control scores for enemy infantry units while they're in combat with this unit. So the unfortunate thing about this is it has two different stipulations. It's only going to affect infantry units, so if you're fighting a monster mash list, it's already useless, and you subtract five if you're in combat with them. So therefore, you need to put your hero, whoever that might be, in combat with this unit who's trying to grab the objective, which is a problem. Uh, and then lastly, it just reduces their control score by five, which isn't that much. Uh, for armies that are really trying to reduce the control score, you can do it significantly to units in AOE, uh, so area of effect. There's, there's, We've seen some others. So already the Infernal Puppet feels better. And then finally, you have once per battle in your hero phase, you have the Realm Warpers Twist Rune. So it's in your hero phase, and it's once per battle, where you can pick a terrain feature within 12 inches this year it to be the target if the target does not have the obscuring terrain feature which means you can't draw a line of sight across it it gains that ability until the start of your next turn then roll a dice for each model friend or foe with it in one inch and you do a uh, roll a dice on a five up you'll take a mortal wound so stipulation is got to be within 12 inches of this unit the effect is only used once per battle the effect is they gain obscuring for only that singular turn uh, that till the start of the next turn and then you might do some mortal wound damage now if your enemy does have all of their models around a piece of terrain that's amazing let's go butt wild uh, but then a third of them are going to take a mortal wound which isn't that impressive so I think you know an incredible heroic trait fine and then infernal puppet feels like the winner 
When you're writing your army list, you're going to choose which battle formation your army is going to be presented into, and there are four to choose from. These will stick across the entire tournament if you're playing at a tournament or, you know, for the game that you're playing. The first one is the Legion of Chaos, and it gives you the passive United in Darkness, where while there is at least one friendly Warriors of Chaos hero, those are keywords that you can find at the bottom of your war scroll, and one other friendly Demon hero, or Dark Oath here on the battlefield, you add two to the control scores of friendly slaves and darkness units where they are contesting an objective that's wholly outside friendly territory. So this has got three different stipulations. You need a hero, you need another type of hero to be alive, and then you need to be outside of your territory, and then you get a minimal plus two to your objective. Uh, I personally am not super keen on this. Maybe it's the best of a bad bunch if you are just running a bunch of warriors, We'll have to see. The uh, next one is God's Wrath Warband, where you get to use a once per turn army ability at the end of your turn. I feel this is probably my favorite one, where you pick an objective that is contested by any friendly units to be the target. Then you place a defile token next to it, then roll a D3 for each enemy unit contesting objective that has a defile token on two plus and inflict an amount of mortal damage on that uh, enemy unit equal to the roll. So this does mean as the game progresses, you're going to be able to keep defiling more of the objectives and therefore, every time you're going to be able to keep rolling, at the end of your turn, sorry, you're going to be able to keep exploding those objectives and causing more damage to your opponent. The timing is really important as well because it's the end of your turn, which means you'll do the end of your turn abilities, they'll do the end of their turn abilities, and then you'll see who controls objectives. So you might ping mortal damage to be able to grab that objective at that per certain time, which is nice. It's nice having plus two control score, but I'd much rather kill their models who are trying to hold the objectives. The next one is to spoilers, and this is this is all uh, wrapped around a demon prince. Once per turn, as a reaction, you declare a fight ability for a friendly demon prince unit. The demon prince unit using that uh, you use that you use this ability for the demon prince who's using that fight ability. You pick a friendly non-hero, slaves to darkness monster or beast. And don't forget, monsters or beasts cannot roll on the eyes of the gods, so. Like, you're picking something that already maybe doesn't want to make it into your list that has not used a fight ability this turn, and it can fight immediately after the Demon Prince. So this entire sub-faction is revolving around needing a Demon Prince, needing to have a hero or monster uh, that's non that's non hero based. And then finally, you've got the Dark Oath Horde, which are the brand new models that have just come out, where once per turn for your army in your movement phase, you can use Rally the Tribes. And if there is a friendly Dark Oath hero on the battlefield, you pick a friendly, non hero, non unique Dark Oath unit, roll a dice on a three up, set up a replacement unit with half the number of models from the target unit rounding up on the battlefield, wholly within six inches of battlefield edge, and more than three inches from all enemy units. So it does not have to be nine inches away. Right? And this is in your movement phase. You aren't able to move after because in the core rules it states when you set up a model, it can't use uh, that turn, it can't use any move abilities. But it does mean it's going to be able to charge later, which is spicy. Because a move ability and a charge ability are different, even though they're types of movement. That one feels like the best one uh, because you're going to be uh, like returning Dark Oath units. But if you're not planning on running a bunch of Dark Oath units, then I feel like Ironclad Onslaught and being able to just despoil the objectives, just keep pinging mortal damage, feels like the best one. So you're going to choose a spell law for your army list as well. And you get a great spell law, you get Law of the Damned, which is nice. You get three different spells. And they're all great. So it's been such a roller coaster. Heroic traits, amazing. Battle traits, amazing. Uh, sub faction rules, like. I think actually the mortal wound damage on objectives is going to end up being really good over time, in my personal opinion, especially if you get the first turn, just like start pinging objectives. Anyway, but spell law, really good. Don't forget, when you note your spell law down, that means any wizards in your army are going to have access to all three of these spells, so they can choose them. You can only normally cast a version of each spell in your hero phase, so one attempt at it, so I can only attempt to do Binding Damnation once. Unless it's got the unlimited keyword you can see there, in which case multiple wizards can attempt it, but they can't attempt it multiple times. I hope that makes sense. And that's good because you have a crazy unlimited spell. It's called Spike Tongue Curse, where you pick an enemy unit within 12 inches. Then if you cast it, which was on the low casting value of a five, if the casting attempt is unsuccessful, or if the spell is unbound, you suffer D3 mortal damage really bad okay but if you cast it inflict three mortal damage on the target which is pretty nice 
Now, obviously, taking D3 mortal damage sucks, but you do have that heroic trait where everyone can heal in a turn, which is honestly pretty interesting as a heroic trait, and then just doing three mortal damage, three mortal damage, three mortal damage. Don't forget you're not choosing this. So if you do have a wizard who's in combat, and then you're like, actually, do you know what? Three mortal damage, take that. That's pretty spicy, in my personal opinion. Okay? Uh, yeah, if you stand near uh, yeah, your terrain feature, which we talked about earlier, you got those pluses to cast as well. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of pluses to unbind or shut magic down. Then you have two other spells. You have Binding Damnation, which is cast on a seven, which is done in your hero phase. Uh, you pick a uh, Slaves to Darkness wizard and you pick an enemy unit within 12 inches. And then if you cast a spell, the target has Strike Last, which is exactly what you want. You want strike last until the start of your next turn. Like you want that in your roster. Don't forget you can use the um, the command ability to do a spell in your opponent's turn. So your opponent gets close enough, you're like, mm, strike last, and they will be screwed. So that is great as well to have uh, in the list. And then finally, demonic speed, where you pick a friendly unit holier than 12 inches of the caster that's casting it, and it's cast on the seven. Right, which is good. So it's the average casting roll, and you add one to the number of dice they make for charge rolls until uh, to a maximum of three until uh, when uh, for that turn. And that is also incredible because you can really double up on a couple of different things. You could do a spell in uh, their turn to give your unit three d six charge, and then counter charge three d six, which is pretty nutty. It's also going to work really well on obviously really big models such as Archeon. So I would say. Strike last or strike first. Strike last is actually technically better because when you give a unit, so strike last is better than strike first as a spell that you can give a unit because when I make an enemy unit strike last, all of my units can attack it as long as they don't have strike last before it strikes me. Whereas if it, I have strike first on one unit, only that unit's going to be able to interrupt. So it's actually the better of the two versions of the spells that you can have in the list. 3d6 charge is what I'd always want to see. Um, and yeah, incredible spell law. So the first of the manifestations we're going to look at is the Eightfold Doom Sigil. Now, uh, all of the manifestations for this manifestation law, sorry, I should mention, on your army list, you get to choose a manifestation law. This is the Slaves to Darkness manifestation law, of which there are three. There are other multiple, uh, there are multiple other generic manifestation laws. Uh, for instance, ones that contain Purple Sun um, or even the Incarnate that you're also going to be able to choose from. But this is the manifestation law that you have available in addition to the generic ones. So you don't have to take these, you can take these, which is nice because you have an elective choice. So they're all cast on a seven, which is nice, and two of them are mobile, and one of them is static, and we'll talk about that one first. We're gonna do an entire show about how manifestations work, so I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of, manner of static versus mobile and all those different changes. We're just gonna talk about what they do. They're also killable. You can also get rid of them uh, by using up a spell cast with the banishment ability, uh, which you can see up there. It's got a banishment value of seven. I think most of them do and it also has a high health value of six uh, not high health value it's pretty rubbish actually six health and a five up save okay so you can kill them so you can run over punch them to death or shoot them if you want to so what does it actually do it's got an ability called empowered by atrocity where if two or more units friendly or enemy were destroyed this turn for the rest of the turn you add one to the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by friendly slaves to darkness units where they're holier than 12 inches this unit Obviously, that is a massive set of conditions. A, I've got to have killed two units to get plus one attack. And then B, I need to be wholly within 12 inches. So it's not great. But situationally, if you can get an additional attack on really high damage weapons that you do can have in a Slave Starters Force, then you're in a good spot. So that's the Eightfold Doom Sigil. The next manifestation is the Dartfire Demon Rift, super sick model, in my opinion. You set this up holier than 12 inches of the caster. It's cast on seven and nine inches away from the enemy. It moves nine inches, got six health, only a six up save, uh, and has got a banishment value of seven. Now, it's got an eight inch shooting attack, which seems to be the purpose of this model, where uh, it does D6 attacks, twos, threes, rend one, damage one, and can shoot into combat, although it being in combat is going to be a real problem uh, because it's only got six health. 
the big news here is that, in my personal opinion, uh, is that you can increase how many dart fire torrent shots it does because it starts at D6 and you can have an additional six shots for every time a, a set spell is successfully cast uh, within 12 inches of this manifestation, you'll get a ruinous energy point. And those ruinous energy points can go from one all the way up to six. It caps out at six. If you have the full six, when you do make a shooting attack with this model, it's going to use any ruinous energy points it's got and also a D6. So... If you've got three, it's going to be three plus D6. If you've got six, it's six plus D6. Twos, threes, rend one, damage one. It's not a bad profile. It's not a great profile, but it's fine. It's free to bring in your army. Are, generic, uh, are the generic manifestations better? Probably, but it's there and available. The last manifestation is also cast on seven, st still set up wholly within 12 inches of the caster and nine inches away from the enemy. It's got a nine inch move. It's got six health and a five up save. Now in combat, it does 2D3 attacks. They hit on fours, which is pretty rubbish. Wounds on a three, rend one, damage one, but it does have crit two hits. So it's not really designed to fight stuff. It is a really long base. It's like a long kind of thin piece. And never forget, because it's a moving piece, it's going to be able to do things like zone out, uh, deep strikes. It's going to be able to block up the board. You can move across them, of course, uh, but you can do some really interesting stuff uh, with these. Uh, with, with mobile manifestations, it's going to be a real problem in the game. So having a long, thin one, it's good. Hashtag, that's what she said. Anyway, what does it do? It has an ability called Debilitating Shockwave, which you can do in any charge phase, where if this manifestation charges phase, you can pick an enemy unit within an inch to be the target. You roll dice for each model in the target unit. For each six, you inflict one mortal damage on the target. If any models in the target unit are slain by this ability, subtract one from hit rolls to the target's attacks for the rest of the turn. Now, that's pretty good if you end up in a horde edition where there's lots of models on the board because you're not only doing some mortal damage, in addition, you're also making the minus one to hit, so it's pretty nice. Overall, the manifestation law feels fine, not super strong. Uh, you already ended up with up. You already ended up with a really fantastic spell law, so probably you'll look towards the generic law anyway, uh, the generic manifestations. But not terrible. Let's go and look at some units. So the first unit we're going to look at is kind of a buff piece for your entire army based on your allegiance ability. So normally we would look at like the, the faction leader Archeon or look at Bellacor or someone. Uh, but we're going to go jump and straight to the Chaos War Shrine because Chaos War Shrine is a hero if you look at the bottom here. And for all you Wolalo fans, he's also a priest. Yeah, he is a priest and uh, he is a hero. Uh, so that means he's going to be able to lead regiments, which is nice as well. And the reason that's good is because he's going to be able to buff up your army. 14 health with a 4-up save is going to make him fairly survivable, which is quite nice. He's also got a control value 5, which is good, probably because as a model, he's going to be moving behind the rest of your force. In addition, he's got an okay combat attack with 10 attacks that can do damage too. You can give it a mark of chaos as well, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and then... It has this amazing passive called Protection of the Dark Gods, where Friendly Warriors of Chaos units have a six-up ward save. Now, don't forget, if they get to roll on the Eye of the Gods and they get themselves the additional plus one to their ward save, that's a six-up ward save plus one ward save for a five-up ward save, which is obviously very, very good. Now, they have this uh, ability in your hero phase to do the favor of the Chaos Gods, which is a prayer. Okay, declare. You pick a visible, friendly, slaves to darkness unit holding within 12 inches of this unit that shares the mark of chaos keyword with this unit to be the target. So that is the kind of stipulation. You have to be like, right, I'm going to take the war shrine and make it mark of Nurgle so I can buff a Nurgle unit. So you're going to, you're going to pre-plan this. You apply one of the following effects to the target for the rest of the turn. If you're doing undivided, um, and that unit has to be holding hold within 12 inches. If it's undivided, which is uh, units that get plus one, to wound against monsters and heroes, then you make three additional rally rolls of a D6. Uh, corn, add one to hit rolls for the target's attacks. This is, and don't forget, you get plus one attacks on the charge. Zinch, you get a four up ward save against spells and manifestations, but now you just get a flat five up ward save. For Nurgle, you add one to wound rolls for the target's attacks. For Sinesh, you add one to the number of dice rolled when making a charge roll up to a maximum of three. So you've got three to six charge on a Sinesh unit. Uh, if the chanting roll was an eight or more, and don't forget you can build up manifestation points uh, by you know just basically rolling, saving those points, use them later, then you can pick up to two eligible units. So you can do some really spicy stuff about that where you try to use an ability in your opponent's turn, uh, sorry, to manifest, uh, to do a prayer in your opponent's turn, generate manifestation points and move on, which I think is good. Um, I think yeah, I'm not saying necessarily based on points, Chaos War Shrine going in the list. Um, maybe there's definitely builds around Chaos Warriors, but feels very effective. 
So the first big model we're going to look at from this army is Archie on the Overchosen with 25 health, 3 up armor save, and moves 14 inches. So he's incredibly fast, a massive wound pool, and a 3 up save. This is a super unique unit. This is a god level character. Um, and therefore, you know, you're building this list and then you're building units around him or to support Archeon in his quest for dominance. So he's got a control value of 10, so it's going to be great for crapping, uh, capping objectives. And he's also going to be a bajillion points. In combat, Pretty good with four attacks that are damage three on the Slayer of Kings, uh, and then six attacks with Draugar, which are also damage three but are hitting on force, which I think will end up being a bit of a weakness. And then Draugar's heads have got three attacks each, and then those are threes and twos. They're only Ren one though, which though is damage five. Uh, so damage five, great, but Ren one is a bit yikesy. So we should also talk about survivability. Sorry, that he's also got a five up ward save, so 25 health, three up armor save, five up ward save. Incredibly tough to get rid of. And we already know that there's some healing in this army as well. Every hero phase, because he's got the monster keyword, could be putting three health back into Archeon. That feels good, is what I'm going to say. <laughs> as well as obviously being able to use rally commands and stuff. It's a war master, so it's the general in your army. If you have multiple war masters, you choose which. It's unique. It's got the hero, uh, so you can only have one Archeon. It's also a monster. Right, okay, so a, a level two wizard that can fight anything and survive everything. Pretty good, like, first up review. In the deployment phase, you can choose which one of the keywords you'd like to give to Archeon, and probably the most important keyword you're going to give them is keyword Nurgle, uh, because that means that he's going to be minus one to be wounded. Feels like the strongest. Obviously, you've got the four at ward save if you want against uh, spells, but Obviously, we've already got that five up ward save. Plus one attack on Corn is only going to add plus one attack to the Slayer of Kings because the other weapons are companion weapons. Uh, and then uh, Sinesh for the plus one to charge and run could be really good, um, especially if you want to do like a 3d6 charge, but you can do a 3d6 charge anyway. Okay in my opinion. Right, so next up is, uh, so I would say you're going to choose uh, Nurgle for the minus one to wound. Next, you have the ability, the Eye of Shireen, which you use once per battle in your hero phase. This took a little bit to work out, so we're going to explain it. The effect is that you roll a dice, and this is done in your hero phase, so it's important. You do it in your hero phase. This, uh, this roll replaces the priority roll for the next battle round. On a one to three, your opponent must take the first turn of that battle round. On a four to six, you must take the first turn of that battle round. This ability cannot be used if there's another Archeon. So why is this so important? We get to know who is going to go next in the next battle round. Well, this is pretty key specifically for battle tactics because you have to, you um, if you ever take a double turn, if you ever choose to take a double turn, you can't choose a battle tactic when you've, uh, in the turn where you're taking the double turn. Okay, so let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. Because you are forced to take a double turn by this ability, you're still going to be able to choose a battle tactic even if you get the double. So in the right situation, let's say my opponent decides is going to take the first turn or I'm going to give them the first turn. Nice. So they're going first in a battle round. Then I go second in a battle round and I use this ability. That means I know whether or not I'm going to get a double turn or my opponent is going to take the next turn. That means I can set up exactly how I like. If I know I'm going to get a double turn and be able to choose a battle tactic, I'm going to be able to commit everything and go all in, which is pretty massive. So effectively, it's a double turn and also the ability to score. And that's super powerful. Really, really powerful. Talking about combat output, as well as, you know, his general damage profile, Archeon has a passive called the Slayer of Kings, where each time this unit uses a fight ability, if the unmodified wound roll of two or more attacks made with the Slayer of Kings, that target is the same hero as a six, that hero is automatically destroyed. So if you're attacking with the uh, Slayer of Kings and you roll two sixes uh, to wound, automatically slain. Any hero. I mean, obviously, some heroes avoid being auto-slain, but... That's amazing as well. Uh, and then he finally has the three-headed Titan Rampage, which is done in any combat phase, which means every combat phase, where you pick one of the following effects, and there are three. Spilth, 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 filth Spewer, sorry about that, uh, lets you pick an enemy unit within six inches of this unit and roll a number of dice equal to the number of models in that unit to a maximum of seven. For each three plus, you inflict one mortal damage. So you're going to inflict four or five mortal damage into a unit, which is nice. I like that. I think that's really good. Uh, <laughs> that's very strong. Skull Gorger lets you roll a dice, and if that roll exceeds the health characteristic of a model in the unit that you're in combat with, then that model is slain, and you heal that value back. 
Now, even if you're just trying to get one wound back, that's pretty strong. But if you're rolling against us, probably you're most likely to be able to like kill two, three wound models pretty easy and then heal them back. That's massive in conjunction with that command trait we talked about earlier on Rally. Um, and then also you've got the ability to just absolutely gank some enemy heroes, which is fun. And lastly, it has Spell Eater where you pick a manifestation, you roll 12 inch, uh, within 12 inches of this unit and roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, it is banished and you inflict D3 mortal damage on the unit that summoned it. So that's pretty nice as well, especially with that Infernal Puppet artifact where they've already taken D3 mortal damage uh, from trying to cast some spells and then you go, do you know what, Spell Eat that uh, and then pop that back. It also means if an enemy wizard is summoning multiple manifestations, you can just keep uh, eating those spells and like, you know, conduiting that damage back, which I think is good. Um, I think that's really fun. Uh, I think that's really, really fun in my personal opinion. Archeon is looking super strong. In my, it, like, absolutely super strong. You get to basically do a double turn. You get to do battle tactics. You're super survival. The amount of healing that's in Slaves to Darkness, ignoring the fact that you auto can have, uh, well, not auto, but you can cast a spell from Archeon himself for three to six charge. And while in combat, can also pick an enemy unit and give them strike last. Feels like he's just got all of the buffs and abilities that he needs to do whatever he likes. So I would say he's, but he's obviously incredibly good, but he's also probably going to cost a lot of points. The next war master, there's loads of them in this army, almost as if they were confused, is Bellacor, the Dark Master. Uh, Bellacor feels incredibly good. 14 health with a 4-up save, and to help with that survivability, he's got a 6-up ward save, and in addition, has got an unrendable save thanks to sh the passive Shadow Form that you can see here, where you ignore modifiers to save rolls for this unit, positive and negative. Um, that 6-up ward save can be improved, obviously, uh, if this unit is able to kill units, which is pretty fun. Uh, and then if you roll on the Eye of the God, it's also a level 2 wizard, and Bellacor's unique, so you can only have one Bellacor in your army. Uh, level 2 wizard is pretty nice because he has a great spell himself, as well as the ability to either give himself or another unit 3 to 6 charge, and in addition, uh, make it so an enemy unit is striking last, which feels pretty strong. Uh, so he has access to debuff spells and as a debuffer because of his spell Enfeeble Foe, which is cast on 6, where you pick an enemy unit within 18 inches that's visible to you, Minus one to the hit rolls on that unit, and they no longer score critical hits. They're just normal hits instead. So if your opponent has buffed up an enemy unit to be really killy, then you can just cast your spell in your opponent's turn and say, no, you're not going to cast that, which is honestly really good. Now, um, <laughs> in addition to uh, the ability to shut down critical hits, he has a rampage, which is amazing, which is done in any combat phase, which is every combat phase, where you pick this unit, so Bellacor, and two friendly Slaves to Darkness units within this unit's combat range. That's super short. You've got to be right next to them. And roll a dice for each of the targets, and every four plus, that target has strike first for the rest of the turn. Now that's pretty great because this means as well as being able to make a unit strike last, you can have up to three of your units strike first. It's a four up, so it's not reliable, but that feels pretty scary when it's done in every single combat phase. And to add to this, as if it wasn't shutting down enough of the enemy ability to do stuff, then uh, once per turn, oh, sorry, I apologize. This isn't every combat phase. That is correct. It's only in the enemy combat phase. It's not in every combat phase, so I'll, I'll change that up. Not quite as good. Only in the enemy combat phase can you make them strike, um, uh, make your unit strike first. Uh, and then you have the Dark Master ability, which is maybe the reason you bring Bellacore, but honestly, the strike first effect is pretty good anyway. Level two wizard that's a monster. Uh, but this is definitely the reason you bring it, because once per battle in the enemy hero phase, you pick a visible enemy unit to be the target, and until the start of your next turn, each time the target is picked to use an ability, you roll a dice as a reaction. On a 3+, plus, that ability has no effect. So moving is an ability, shooting is an ability, fighting is an ability. So anytime you would like to use an ability, you can't use that ability. Uh, which is great. Uh, well, you can't use it if you, if you roll a three up. And then it lasts until the start of your next turn. So because you'll do this in the enemy hero phase, what will happen is, is they'll do all their abilities in their turn, like spell casting and other stuff in their hero phase. And then you'll use this ability, which means they will be able to cast spells. 
But then, if they end up getting a double turn, this is going to go into their hero phase again, where it's still going to mean they're not going to cast spells. Well, well if they if you roll a three up and you go through that list as well until your turn. So this is like an anti-double turn mechanic when we already know you've got Archeon, and obviously taking both of these together means you're not going to have anything on the board apart from two big monsters. Uh, but... Archeon's got that other way to mess around with how priority rolls work, uh, which is just super nice. So um, I love it. This is great. Uh, this is especially good because they will have also chosen their battle tactic when you use this as well. So they'll choose their battle tactic and then you'll use Dark Master. Uh, so potentially shutting down one of their units, they're going to try and score them battle tactics and stuff. He's a level two wizard. He's pretty fighty. I didn't even mention that. With eight attacks, threes, threes, ren, two, damage two. He's going to have two attacks uh, that do damage two as well, uh, but they get charge plus one damage. I didn't even mention that his control value 10, which is also incredible uh, for going and capping an objective. So overall, Bellacore's probably an auto-include in your army uh, because he's a level two caster, shuts down the enemy units. I can't see how you wouldn't bring Bellacore, is the answer. The next unique hero that we're going to look at, so you're going to take one of them in your army, is Abraxia, the Spear of the Everchosen. And she is coming out very good. 14 health with a 3-up save and a 5-up ward save is going to make this a very survivable monster, which obviously you can do a lot of healing to as well. So 5-up ward save down there at the bottom of the war scroll. In addition to that, it's got control value 5, which is nice. So... This guy does a, this lady, sorry, does a lot of stuff. And we probably should talk straight away about the passive Warlord of the First Circle. Uh, that's what I'd like to talk about. If a friendly Varangard unit uses the Relentless Killer's ability while it's wholly within 12 inches of this unit, the Varangard is a unit of three elite cavalry, which has a once per battle ability to pile in and strike twice. However, the second time that they fight or use a fight ability is going to have the strike last effect. So the idea is you charge in, you fight, they get to hit you back, and then you pile in again and attack. However, if a friendly Varangard unit and multiple units, if they're within wholly within 12 inches, use that ability, that unit does not have the strike last as a result of the ability. Therefore, that means you can strike and then, you know, in that activation step, you can strike again. If your opponent gets given strike last, you're also going to be able to uh, fight twice before them, which is pretty nice. And if you're running around with Bellacore and you had a unit of Varangard, you can have strike first and then strike at the normal step. There are three steps you strike at in combat. Strike first, strike at the normal step, and strike last. So you'd be able to go from strike at the normal step to strike last, to strike first and strike normal step, which is a pretty significant bonus as well. So that's really nice. Also, uh, I should just point out that Abraxia has also got the keyword undivided. So the combat profile on Gorbolga, the weapon that Abraxia is carrying, is five attacks, threes, and threes. However, you get plus one to wound against monsters and heroes because of undivided. Rend two, damage two. Against heroes, you get an additional plus one rend, and on the charge, you get an additional plus one damage. We should talk about the fact that you can improve the effects of Gorbolga, the weapon, uh, that has uh, if you you can do in the combat phase by rolling a dice. Gorbolga the Accursed will roll a dice, and on a roll of a one, you'll take one damage on Abraxia. On a roll of two, the effect uh, the spear has no effect, but on a roll of three to five, you get White Hot Varanite, where you add one to the damage characteristic of this unit's Gorbolga for the rest of the turn, which does mean on the charge it's going to go up to damage four. On a roll of a six, not only do you get the plus one damage, you also get the Crit Mortal special rule, which means any sixes to hit are going to also do the damage value in mortal damage, which will mean... Uh, five attacks. If you do, if you do plus one to hit and you're hitting a hero, five attacks, twos and twos, rend three, damage four, which is pretty nice. Uh, and then finally, well, not finally. Abraxia also has a Rampage that you can do once per turn in the combat phase, which means every combat phase, because it's any. And you pick an enemy hero and roll a dice on a 3+, plus. you subtract 1 from the attack characteristic of the target's melee weapons, which is fine. Uh, not that much to shout about. And then finally, Blood of the Molten Varanite is a passive, where each time uh, this model takes damage inflicted on it from combat attacks, on a 4+, plus, you inflict 1 mortal damage on the attacking unit after fight ability has been resolved. 
So that's pretty good. If you do end up killing or doing a lot of wounds to this unit in combat, then you're going to take half that number of damage, basically back in mortal damage. What's pretty spicy is obviously you've also got those heals we talked about earlier because Abraxia is a monster, so you could do a lot of healing back on Abraxia as well. In fact, if you have Braxia and Bellacor stood next to each other and your hero that's carrying around the command trait for healing three, this does mean you could put three wounds back onto Abraxia, or you could potentially put three wounds back onto Abraxia, Abraxia and Bellacor each every hero phase, which feels strong, in my opinion. Anyway, Abraxia is nuts. You're going to see Abraxia with Varangard, possibly two units of six, gun it down the board, murder everything, and then, you know, just have a great time. Next up, we're going to look at a Demon Prince. This is a non-unique uh, character, so you can take you can take multiple Demon Princes. You may want to. They're kind of interesting. They've got 10 health with a 3-up save and move 8 inches, and they've got a 6-up ward save. You can improve... Uh, the movement value and move them from 8 uh, to a movement of 10 if you decide to have wings or you can take the trophy rack if you take the trophy rack instead this unit has uh, anti-hero plus 1 rend on their weapon profile their weapon profile is 6 attacks 3s and 3s rend 1 damage 3 and crit mortals so the rend is pretty low there to be honest, would it be, I would have been okay with Ren 2 on a Demon Prince of all things. And you choose a Mark of Chaos for this Demon Prince when you write your army list. And obviously they're going to give him all the buffs we talked about earlier. But probably the reason you're going to bring a Demon Prince, and maybe the reason you'll bring a couple of Demon Princes, is because of the ability Ruinous Favor that you can do in your hero phase. You pick a friendly, non-unique, so you can't do this on Archeon or Bellacore, Unit wholly within 12 inches of this unit that shares a bark of chaos keyword with this unit to be the target. Roll a dice and on a three up, you can roll on the eye of the gods, which is where you can get those buffs that we talked about earlier. I think especially plus one rend feels really nice. I've said multiple times in across these videos, but Games Workshop really doesn't understand scale. It never really has. So being able to do this on a unit of, let's say, six Varangard or ten Chosen or something like that, which is obviously a lot of a lot of weapon attacks and abilities that you're improving from a single dice roll. That means that you can make that roll a th on a three up, they can roll and get plus one rend, which is nice. You do that in your hero phase. So then they're going to be able to, obviously, when they go kill stuff, and you can effectively pump up how effective this is. Um, the Demon Prince is not a wizard uh, here, uh, and, uh, and you can take multiple Demon Princes and use this ability multiple times, but not multiple times on the same unit. So I could use this ability multiple times on different units, but not on the same unit. And I think legitimately working out which units your Demon Prince are going to be able to buff is going to be something that you're going to spend a long time doing, which I think is going to be really fun. And then you're going to roll a one or two, which is going to be hilarious. But either way, the Demon Prince is looking like a solid combat character. And in addition, uh, and also uh, maybe what the person that's traveling around with some of the larger models, being able to heal them thanks to that, uh, that tr heroic trait, while also making units roll on the Eye of the Gods. So it feels very, very good. Next up, we're going to look at Eternus, the Blade of the First Prince. So Eternus is pretty interesting because of two mechanics that you've got here. Let's look at him as a base war scroll first. He's got nine health with a three-up save, moves nine inches, and his control value two. So he's more of like a melee character with six attacks that do damage two with plus one damage on the charge, which could do a significant amount of damage and then uh his mount whose name i won't try to pronounce has got three attacks uh that do damage one so it's not important you'll never have to remember he has got the ability to come back from the dead if he is killed then in any movement phase you can use veins of black lightning where this unit can use his ability if it's been been destroyed you roll 2d6 and you add one to the roll if a friendly bellicor is on the battlefield on an eight plus you set up a replacement unit on the battlefield more than nine inches from enemy units and you are going to be able to do that in your opponent's movement phase when this would happen is your opponent would do all of their movement abilities and then you would do your movement abilities. Uh, therefore, that's when this would come back. So it's quite spicy to do it in your opponent's turn, especially before they're about to do charges or shooting. I think this is quite interesting. In addition, you have a reaction for when your opponent declared a command for a unit within 12 inches of this unit. Roll a dice and you add one to the roll if an enemy unit is in combat with a friendly Chaos Legionaries or Furies unit. On a 5+, plus, that command has no effect. The command still counts as having been used for the command point spent to, and, uh, to use the command points are still lost. So you can, 33% of the time, you're going to be able to steal command abilities. And those command points and command abilities are super vital. Being able to cast opponent, a spell on your opponent's turn, being able to even all-out defense or all-out attack, I guess. But I guess counter charge is the biggest one because they're going to lose two 
uh, points, which I think is pretty key, as well as some pretty crucial command abilities that are located on War Scrolls, like returning slain models, which is nice. So you can only bring him back from the dead once because it's a replacement unit, and you can steal unit's command abilities. But Eternus and many of the units in this roster are going to be battling it out against units like Bellacor to make it into the table. And Bellacor just brings more utility, also being a wizard. Obviously, Eternus will be a lot less points. I think what's interesting is that there was definitely feels already like there are loads of, I don't want to say mid-table builds, but very different and fun and engaging builds with units like Eternus uh, or even Abraxia, which are very different to just having a big Archeon or even bring, bringing Bellacore, although they work really well together, which is nice. So I'm really liking what feels like a very open book already. So we're going to start looking at some of the buff pieces you can have for this army, specifically the wizards. Uh, and, you know, a really famous one is the Gaunt Summoner on Disc of Zinch with six health and a four up armor save. Uh, it's a level two caster, which is obviously really effective because you're going to be able to cast Manifestations as well as those wicked spell law spells. Um, and is also really fast and is pretty tanky with a six up ward save, six health and a four up armor save. So it can survive in combat okay, which is really good because of its spell. Its spell that it brings along with it is Arcane Imprisonment, which is a unique spell to it, which is cast on a seven. You pick an enemy hero in combat with this unit to be the target. Then you make a roll of 2d6. If the unmodified casting roll exceeds, exceeds the target's health characteristic, it is automatically destroyed. And for the rest of the battle, that unit cannot be picked to be the target of the ability that allows a replacement unit to set it up. That's fantastic. That's really good. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a gamble. We'd like, you know, like you do have to be in combat, which is also a problem as well. But, you know, there are some like really good combat characters where you might be in combat with, I don't know, you might charge this in at the same time against Sigvald. Let's pick Sigvald as an example, right? With a unit of Varangard. And maybe the Varan maybe Sigvald's like, I'm going to attack the Varangard and not the Gaunt Summoner, which leaves the opportunity for you to be like, cool, I'm going to try and do this spell either in my turn or my opponent's turn. Um, and, you know, uh, take Sigvald off the board, which I think would be interesting. The ability to not allow destroyed units to return is also spicy as well. If this isn't the only reason to take it, as well as being a two cast wizard and being pretty fast at 14 inches, he's also got the it's also got the ability in the deployment phase to put one unit in the silver tower. Then in your movement phase, you can pick a friendly unit in the silver tower to be the target and set up that target on the battlefield wholly within 12 inches of this unit and more than nine inches from all enemy units, which is like a pseudo kind of teleport. It is definitely a deep strike. This is pretty fun because he moves 14 inches. Uh, so you're going to be able to do this in addition to a run and then also drop a unit down. So on the first turn, you could potentially uh, drop a unit right in your opponent's back lines, maybe near their terrain feature, which I think is quite spicy. Itself, it's not great in combat, but it's a wizard, uh, which is fine. It does have two attacks damage D3 thanks to the disc that it rides. And it does have an okay shooting attack that does three shots at 12 inch range that are fours and threes rend one damage D3 with crit mortal. And that's a really good shooting profile. Like, to be honest, like if you ended up with a slightly longer range on that on, uh, you know, a unit of Skyfires for Zinch, you'd be like, you know, that's a decent, you know, three shots, D3 damage, crit mortals, that's pretty good. Uh, so that's not nothing to sniff at. But it's a level two wizard at the end of the day. It's got this incredibly fun mechanic uh, to auto slay heroes, and you can put it up into Deep Strike. It feels really nice. The other version of the Gaunt Summoner uh, has got five health with only a six up save. Still has a six up ward save, but thankfully it's still a two cast wizard. So it's a very effective wizard. It's also got the Zinch keyword. I should have pointed that out. This unit also allows you to put a unit inside the Silver Tower during the deployment phase. So during deployment, put one unit in the Silver Tower and reserve. And you, in your movement phase, you're still able to bring a unit on the board while wholly within 12 inches of the Gaunt Summoner and 9 inches from all enemy units. However, if you cast a spell unique to this unit, Divert Realm Gate, which is cast on a 7, Units set up using the Profane Secret, so the ability to set units up with this uh, ability, instead of being wholly within 12 and 9 inches away from the enemy, are wholly within 18 inches and, seven, and outside of 7 inches from the enemy, which is very close, right? Very, very close, which means you can do some crazy first-turn charges. You can cap objectives your opponent weren't expecting to do, which is really nice. And again, you can still move this guy kind of far, move 5 inches, maybe do a run, when you set up the Book of Profane Secrets. Uh, when, sorry, when you 
when you set up the unit from the Book of Profane Secrets. Apart from that, it's a two-cast wizard. You've got great spells in your lore, and you're going to want to do manifestations. Great unit. To keep on our theme of looking at wizards, we're going to look at the Chaos Sorcerer Lord. Now, this Chaos Sorcerer Lord is not uh, as good as the Gaunt Summon. It only is a level one wizard, which is pretty rubbish. Uh, but thankfully, it doesn't, uh, thankfully or sadly, it doesn't have its own War Scroll spell, so you'll be choosing either a Manifestation or casting those badass uh, uh, spell laws. And it's obviously not built for combat. It can take any of the Marks of Chaos apart from Corn, obviously, because Corn hate wizards. And it's got five health and four up saves, so pretty survivable. Uh, but thankfully, you're going to bring this guy along if you're going to run a bunch of Chaos Warriors because of Oracular Visions where in your hero phase you can pick a friendly Warriors of Chaos unit wholly within 12 inches of this unit to be the target and roll a dice. Okay, on a 3+, plus, the target has a ward save of 5+. plus. Okay, so a 5 at ward save and this is also good for Varangard and Chosen and Knights of Chaos all who also have the Warriors of Chaos chaos keyword might be some other units as well uh but that means you can have i mean all of those units are great 20 warriors of chaos with a five up ward save six varangard with a five up ward save feels really good chosen knights knight the ten, unit of 10 knights i think they're four health each so that's 40 health with three up armor save five up ward save that is making mark a nurgle minus one to wound that's that's very good very very good, but it is situational. It's only going to happen on a three up, uh, and it's in your hero phase, but it is until the start of your next turn, so not even for one turn. The other version of the Chaos Lord is mounted on a big old manticore, and this improves the survivability of your Chaos Lord, giving it 12 health with a four up save and a massive five inch movement, as well as making your self control value five. The Sorcerer's Reaping Staff and also the Manticore's attacks are fine, although the monster hits on fours, and I think that makes it weak source to be honest. However, you still got that oracular visions ability that you saw in the other Chaos Sorcerer Lord, so you're definitely going to be able to give a unit a 5 up ward save. That ability is once per turn in the army, so that does mean if you have a Chaos Lord on foot or a Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Mantic or even two of either, you're still only going to be able to attempt to do it one time in your hero phase. Uh, the Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Mantic has got a Rampage where you pick an enemy monster in combat with this unit to be the target and you roll a dice, on a three up, that target has strike last. So this will be our second example of strike last in the list. So if we're up against two enemy units and we would like to make one of them strike last and we go make our monster strike last at the same time, then that means our whole army is going to be able to hit them before they hit us, which is nice. But thankfully, if they hit us, we have an incredible armor save, loads of wounds and a good ward save. So that's good too. The next hero we're going to look at is the Centurion Marshal. He's got 10 health, 4 up save, moves 8 inches, and is a combat character in that he's got 6 attacks, 3s and 3s, rend 1, damage 2, with plus 1 damage on the charge. For 6 attacks that are damage 3, but that low rend 1 means he's not going to be able to do a lot of damage, especially into heavily armoured units, which the Slaves to Darkness army is a great example of uh, because of all their really high armour saves. Uh, survivability is fine, but has no ward save, and has a reaction uh, ability that you can do if you declared a fight ability with this unit, which means a non-hero undivided unit uh, has to can also get a fight ability, can fight immediately after this unit. So this guy fights, and then a the unit that's in combat with him, so within three inches combat range, can make a pile in a fight immediately after. But that's pretty useless because this guy is also pretty useless. So he's never not been good, and he continues to be so. The Chaos Lord on Demonic Mount is very similar to the Centurion Marshal. 8 health, 3 up save, move 10 inches, is a cavalry combat character uh, where you've got cursed weapons with 5 attacks that are damage 2 with plus 1 damage on the charge. Maybe better than the Centurion Marshal, you do have Ren 2, which I quite like, and the mount doesn't do very much uh, and can take any of the marks of Chaos. In addition, he has a reaction ability, and this is the same as the reaction ability we saw previously, where... Um, if you fight with this person and then you choose or this unit, sorry, and then you pick a non-hero Warriors of Chaos Cavalry unit, so that's going to be Varangard or Knights. There might be another unit, but probably those. Uh, they get to fight immediately after, and then you get plus one to wound for that unit. So I guess the fact that the unit fights after is pretty like is pretty like mid. That's not the reason you take it. I guess the reason that you would want to buddy this up with a cavalry unit is for the plus one to wound aura, which I think is quite interesting. 
Like, I think that's quite interesting. Plus one to wound aura is quite interesting. Depends how cheap he is, but effectively you're doing a combo charge. Uh, and because there's a lot of strike first and strike last in this army, that means that you're going to be able to maybe hit with everything first at plus one to wound, which is honestly a great buff. Our next mounted Chaos Lord is now mounted upon a Karkadrak. Uh, he's got 10 health with a 3-up save, which is really, really nice. Uh, moves 9 inches. Got 5 hexed weapon attacks, which have plus 1 damage on the charge. And these have crit mortals. And his mount's okay as well, with 4 attacks doing damage too. There's a couple of reasons maybe you would take the Chaos Lord on Karkadrak, as well as being able to give him any of the marks of Chaos. In the charge phase, he can use a Brutish Rampage, which in any charge phase, if this unit charges this phase, you can pick up to three enemy units within one inch of it, roll a D3 on two plus, do that many mortal damage. What's exciting is, is that ability is more powerful as a charge ability than a Mega Gargan. You, like, that's huge. So that's pretty nice. In addition, he's also got a once per battle ability in any charge phase where you can pick this unit and up to two friendly non-hero Warriors of Chaos units, wholly within 12 inches, and add two to the charge rolls for the targets for the rest of the turn. So as an example, if you would like to, you could choose Abraxia and six Varangard. Uh, sorry, you can't choose Abraxia, sorry. That's wrong, because that's a hero. You could choose two units of Varangard and give them plus two to charge. You can also cast a spell for 3d6 charge if you really want to. In addition to that, if you'd like, you could also use uh, pick a unit that the Gaunt Summoner has dropped seven inches away from your opponent, as long as it's got the Warriors of Chaos keyword, and now you're seven inches away with plus two to charge, which is pretty nice. Um, so yeah, he's really good, great tech piece. Really is going to be depending on how you want to build your list. Do I want to charge a Chaos Lord and Demonic Mount in and get plus one Wound Aura? Great decision. Do I want to guarantee charges better? Do I just want Chaos Lords on Karkadrax running around and in every charge phase just doing loads of mortal damage? Maybe. Can I take five of these? Does that mean when I charge five of these in, that's going to be 5d3 mortal damage? Because it sounds like that's yes. Pretty cool unit. The next Chaos Lord, there's so many of them, no wonder they're so jealous of each other, is got six health with a three up save and moves five inches. It's got some attacks in combat and can take any of the marks of chaos, which is nice. Uh, and his ability is similar to the mounted versions where once you fight with this unit, you can pick a Warriors of Chaos infantry unit that is in combat range of this model and they can fight immediately after this unit, skipping up the step and past your opponent and they get plus one to wound rolls for that unit as well. That might be really nice on Chosen as a really good example. And he's thankfully got six health with three up save, so he's kind of survivable, which is nice. So hopefully he's cheap because he's a support unit that goes along with a much larger unit. The next unit is an exalted hero of chaos with six health and a three up save. He doesn't benefit your army in any way. And instead, he's definitely for meme builds where you're having the best narrative day of your life. He's a foot character that only moves five inches with five attacks that are damaged two. And he's got anti-hero rend one and anti-monster rend one. Um, what that means is, is that if you were fighting a hero that is also a monster, that would be Ren 3. Five, at five attacks, Ren 3, damage 2. So it's got a passive called Glory Seeker where you add one to the damage characteristics characteristic of this unit's melee weapons if you're targeting heroes or monsters and you can take them in the mark with the mark of corn so this bad boy you could send up as a, of a send off as a missile imagine a 3d6 charge six attack threes and threes rend three damage three fella that's just out there to snipe a character even do some pretty significant damage to a big hero monster is really funny in my personal opinion. Uh, yeah, if he's like 50 points, he's great. If he's like 150 points, it's terrible. Uh, so but he, what's important about this war scroll is that it's fun. What you're looking here is a personal mission. You go into an event, you're going to play at the local club, and you're like, got an exalted hero of chaos, and you just make that happen. Does it? Is it going to be like competitive or make sense? No, but it's just fun. That's what it's there for. Oh, here's an example. Thank you to Oostogen in the chat. Take, go for the mark of undivided on all of these. So you're going to get plus one to wound against Nagash. Well, against a hero, sorry. Then you just take five of them. You get strike last off on Nagash and five of these beat him. They beat him like school bullies are beating up a nerd. They just gang up and they're like, bang, 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 bang. You just take him out. And that'll teach Nagash for reading books. 
Hopefully our last ever Chaos Lord is mounted on a Manticore. It's got 12 health with a 4-up save, and obviously you can give him a mark of chaos. Moves 12 inches, which is nice and fast, so it can keep up with your other fast monster characters. So he's got 5 attacks that are damage 2, and he's got crit mortals. And the Manticore's Claws and Fangs have got 6 attacks, which hit on 4s, but are damage 2, and they get plus 1 rend against a monster. They have an ability called Apex Predator, which is a rampage that they do in any combat phase, where they pick an enemy monster and you add one to hit rolls to this unit's combat attacks, and that, tar that target the monster for the rest of the turn, and that's also going to improve companion attacks. So that's fine, but the reason you're really going to take him is because of the passive Iron Willed Overlord, where you add two to the control scores for friendly Warriors of Chaos units, where they're holding within 12 inches. If you buddy this up, obviously with the battle formation we saw earlier, with the ability to add plus two, this does mean multiple units are going to be able to have plus two to their control score for holding objectives, which is pretty nice. Do I think that that's spending all those points on this unit? I'm not sure right now, but the Chaos Lord on Manticore's got an okay damage profile. The next hero is an Ogroid Mimrodon, and we've been really excited about this guy for a long time, and he's never really had the place in the sun that we need, and I think, I think we're in. Eight health with a four-up save is pretty low survivability for what is a frontline melee character. He has got the ability to choose any of the marks uh, of Chaos, so if you'd like to improve his survivability, you can go for the mark of Nurgle, and if you'd like to improve his output in combat, you can obviously do that with the mark of Corn. He has a Gladiator Spear Shot, which is 10-inch range. One attack, threes and threes, rend one damage, three. But the cheeky ability that you have with this guy is uh, in combat with his gladita gladita Gladiator Spear. He's got six attacks, threes and twos, rend one damage, three. That's anti-monster rend one. If he's taken any damage, he's got Mimrodon Rage ability, where he's going to have plus two attacks. That's going to be eight attacks. If you give him the Mark of Corn and he charges, that's going to be nine attacks, threes and twos, rend one, damage three. That's really nice especially with all the um with all the strike last that's in this army as if that wasn't enough he obviously can fight alongside Mimrodon, uh, ogroid theradon units where if you declare a fight ability with this unit then the ogroid theradons are going to be able to immediately strike afterwards and if they do so they get plus one to hit probably not as powerful a combo as a braxia and varangard but he's still a great combo if you're looking to run Theradons who are going to do a ton of damage. Uh, this guy doesn't have a ward save, which is probably one of his weaknesses, and the low health pool. So hopefully he just ends up quite cheap, right? Um, and, you know, you've always got the opportunity to roll on the Eye of the Gods if you start killing units and gain a ward save, which is pretty spicy as well. As well as all the other buffs we talked about for 3d6 charges, there's loads of stuff here. So I think the Ogro Ogroid Mimrodon could see play. If not at, like, top table competitive Warhammer, I would say that I think you're going to be able to play with this guy on the tabletop and he's not super rubbish. Now we've got into slightly littler fellas. Uh... Shout out to all my short kings out there in the world. The Dark Oath Chieftain is also a hero, but it's got the Dark Oath keyword, and most of these uh, benefit units are going to benefit the Dark Oath models. He has the Undivided keyword, which is pretty cool in my opinion, and you've got five health with a five up save, so not very survivable. However, if he completes his oath, which you do once per battle at the end of any turn, the Oath of Murder is an effect where if this unit destroyed an enemy hero or monster, this unit is going to get strike first for the rest of the battle. This is a pretty tall ask for a guy with only five attacks that do damage too, but I'm here for it. The main reason you would probably bring the Dark Oath Chieftain is the ability to have the tribal war leader reaction for when you decide to fight with him. So you fight with a Dark Oath Chieftain, and then you're able to pick a Dark Oath infantry unit that is in combat range with it. That target can be picked to use the fight ability, and when they do so, they get plus one to their attacks characteristic, which is great, because Dark Oath models, specifically Marauders, are going to have a lot of attacks and a lot of models, so you're going to be adding more onto that, which is really nice. Uh, so, love this guy. I honestly would like to build this list. Is it going to be good? We'll have to see. He's not survivable. He'll die to most things. But it's a really fun time. The Dark Oath War Queen. 
uh, for all my uh, my girl bosses out there. Has got five health with a five up save, but a five up ward save, so it's quite survivable compared to the 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 other the Dark Oath boss. It's got five attacks that do damage two with crit mortals. But the reason you're bringing this character is because of the support it brings to the other Dark Oath models. First up, in your turn, in your hero phase, once per turn, you can pick an objective objective this unit is contesting, and you roll a dice on a three up for the rest of the turn. Other friendly Dark Oath units have a five up ward save while they're contesting objective. There's a bit of a problem with this in that on a th uh, is a bit of a problem in that it's only for your turn. If it's for the battle round, it'd be really good. If it was till the start of your next turn, it would be even better. That would be nice. But this means it's only going to be active on your turn and it's on an unreli unreliable three up. That said, though, if it does pop off, I don't think I'd hate that idea. Um, so yeah, that's that. And then in addition, she has the once per battle in any charge phase Oath of Supremacy, where if this unit is wholly within enemy territory in charges phase, for the rest of the battle, you can add plus one to hit rolls for combat attacks made by friendly Dark Earth units where they're wholly within 12 inches of this unit. So plus one to hit permanent aura around this unit is pretty nice. It means you don't have to spend your command points for the command resource. It's pretty interesting. Ultimately, I feel like you're not you're not going to bring Archeon and a Dark Oath War Queen. You're going to build a Dark Oath army. But if you see that as like an almost completely separate army and list, I think you could do some really fun stuff with this. Is it going to be as strong as Archeon or Bellacore or Varengard? Probably not. But it could be very engaging and fun to play. I'm just going to take a moment right now because I know we're in the middle of this video. Uh, just take a moment to talk about the fact that this army has got like a lot of strike last in it. And therefore those heroes, which we've talked about 18 million of them apparently, and their ability to strike and then their units strike immediately after them means that you are going to be able to combo those quite nicely. The survivability of those heroes is probably something to bring into question. Uh, but when they do have strike last, you're going to be able to just slam these combos into the enemy unit. And that feels pretty fun and engaging. Gunnar Brand is a hero with six health, a five up save, and moves five inches. And he is one of our Dark Oath infantry. So he's got the undivided keyword on get plus one to hit against heroes and monsters, which is good because this guy has got 10 attacks with his dual axes, fours and threes, rend one, damage one, and has got crit mortal. However, if this unit is using a fight ability in any combat phase and he's fighting against an enemy hero, he can use two fight abilities, but... He then, the second fight ability will have strike last. Of course, you can make the enemy unit strike last. So you can have 20 attacks with crit mortals, which is really fun. In addition, he has a once per battle ability, which you succeed at the end of any turn, called Oath of Bloodshed, where you declare that this unit only uses this ability if any enemy heroes were slain by this unit's combat attacks. For any gunners, Oath Sworn units have a four up ward save for the rest of the battle. Is this guy an 11 out of 10 unit? No. Could he be really fun to build and play, like, and play and hunt heroes? I think yes. And so it's cool that that's there. Singri Brand is also another one of Oath's brand and it's got four health, a five up save, moves 12 inches, got an 18 inch shot uh, that does two uh, shots that do D3 damage. Her, she's obviously not very good in combat and herself uh, can only be targeted by shooting attacks that score critical hits or it can be hit by critical hits thanks to the Swift of Wind passive. passive, And it's got the uncanny shot ability where you add one to the Ren characteristic of this unit's Singri Warbow for attacks that target enemy units while they're within six inches of a friendly gunner brand, which will be three shots that do crit or wound damage D3. And again, a fun narrative character that you could build into your list if it's cheap enough to just do some really fun stuff with. Dark Oath Chieftain on Warsteed is uh, a 7 health, 4 up save hero that moves 12 inches and is not too bad in combat with 5 attacks that do hit on 4s but they are crit mortals and it's damaged too which is pretty spicy. He's got the Warsteed's hooves uh, with 2 attacks but that's not really that important. The two reasons that this unit is important specifically is the Cavalry War Leader which gives a passive so that you can reroll charge rolls for Dark Oath Cavalry units with a they're holier than 12 inches of this unit. That's going to be uh, those uh, Dark Oath Cavalry, uh, and they're not too bad, actually, on the charge, which is quite spicy. So I really like that, the reroll charges. And it has an ability that you do once per battle at the end of any turn called the Oath of Murder, where if this unit destroyed an enemy hero or monster this turn, this unit has strike first for the rest of the battle. Is he going to kill a hero or monster? I'm not really sure. Uh, to be honest, he's there for the reroll uh, charges. Anyway. Cool, let's move on to the next unit. First unit we get to look at, I went straight to the top and I went for the Varangar because we've been talking about them so much. This is unit of three who have five health each with a three up armor save. 
which is pretty nice. And therefore, 15 health from unit 3, reinforceable to unit 6. Move 10 inches, which is fast enough, especially with 3d6 charge in the army. And they've got 3 attacks each, 3s and 3s, rend 2, damage 2. However, on the charge, they get crit, uh, they get crit plus, well, they get plus 1 damage on the charge, and they also have crit mortals. So that is, um, they, that gives them damage 3, and therefore, uh, you are going to be able to have crit mortals be damage three, which I think personally is pretty stunning. Uh, nine attacks at the unit. They've got a champion, so it's going to be 10 attacks, uh, 30 damage potential, and then their mount. And then the reason that Vanguard have always been incredibly good, apart from that amazing profile, is the fact that they've got Relentless Killers, which is an ability you can do once per battle. When any combat phase, this unit can use two fight abilities, uh, but the second ability is Strike Last. But you already know Abraxia can skip that. You can make enemy units fight last. You can uh, make units strike first with Bellacore. You can give them the Mark of Corn, so they're going to end up with four attacks each on the charge. Uh, four attacks each, damage three on the charge. Feels insane, in my opinion. Fighting twice is pretty good. Varengard, absolutely massive stonks. I wouldn't be surprised if he was very expensive, something like 310 points, don't know. But amazing, uh, amazing unit. And they're also really survivable as well. If you want to make them survivable, give them the Mark of Nurgle, really good. Next unit we're going to talk about are Chaos Warriors. This is a unit of 10 models with two health each with an incredible three up save. They move five inches, which is slow, but you've got 3d6 charges and a million other things in this army. And they're a control value of one. Don't forget, because they have the Warriors of, keyword, War, Warriors of Chaos keyword, like the Varangar did, these guys are going to be able to get a five up ward save as well if you use the Oracular Visions from either a Chaos Social Lord or a Chaos Social Lord on Manticore. They also get plus one to their attacks characteristic of this unit's rune etched weapons while it's contesting an objective, which would be three attacks each, threes, threes, rend one, damage one. They are the perfect anvil unit. Uh, you're going to give them the mark of Nurgle, but you could give them the mark of Corn if you want to for potentially four attacks. Um, uh, while contesting objective, if you charge, it's a little bit harder to do. But Mark and Nurgle probably so that they're minus one to wound. Uh, that means, and then give them a five at ward save. And these guys will sit on an objective forever. The only negative probably that a unit of 20 is only going to be a control score of 20. There are abilities we've seen which can drastically reduce the control score of object of units. And in addition, something like Brutes, just make it so that units with one or two health don't even... Um, don't even control objectives, which is an issue as well. But this is a massive brick of very, very survivable models, which in addition, if you rally, you're going to bring back something really good. So warriors are really good, but they they fulfill a very specific role, which isn't as flashy as Varangard in that they are incredibly tough to kill. Next unit is Chaos Knights. This is a unit of five cavalry. Each unit in this model has got four health for 20 health over this entire unit, which is amazing. They have that three-up armor save as well, obviously, as the ability to take any mark of chaos. So you want them to do more damage on the charge? Give them corn. You want them to be more survivable? Then hit them with Nurgle. Uh, they also um, can get that five-up ward save because they have that Warriors of Chaos keyword at the bottom uh, from from Chaos Sorcerer Lord or from a Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Manticore, which is pretty impressive in my opinion. Strike last on the enemy units thanks to spell, 3d6 charge thanks to a different spell, strike first from Bellacore are all the ways that you can improve this unit. If you did reinforce this unit to a unit of 10 and gave it the mark of corn, that would be a total of 40 attacks that you are going to be able to do, which are going to be threes and threes. If you simultaneously charge this with a Chaos Lord on a... Um, uh, on a demonic mount, then you are going to be able to give them plus one to wound. For 40 attacks, twos and twos, rend two because they get plus one rend on the charge and damage two because they get plus one damage as well. So that's 40 attacks uh, from a unit that probably will never die because it's a bajillion. A reinforced unit is 40 health with a three up armor save. That's bananas in my opinion. But these guys are obviously much better in combat uh, when they've charged. So really nice. The other Warrior of Chaos unit is Chaos Chosen. This is a unit of infantry, and they have five models apiece. Well, sorry, uh, five models uh, in the unit with three health each on a three-up armor save. They have got uh, move five, and they've got all the things that the other guys can do with uh, 3d6 charges, make enemy units strike last. Uh, but specifically, this unit has got three attacks per model for a total of 15, 
uh, plus one for the champion. Threes and threes, rend one, damage two. The rend one is really rough in my personal opinion, but they do have crit mortals. So 15 attacks from a unit of five, uh, sorry, 16 attacks from a unit of five, 31 attacks from a unit of uh, 10 is going to do a lot of damage especially thanks to the ability to pile in and attack twice, thanks to Heralds of Ruination, where once per battle in any combat phase, this unit can use two of fight abilities, but obviously the second one is going to be striking last. So do you want, you're really just choosing between which damage applications do you want. Do you want Varengard, who are fast like knights and can fight twice? Do you want knights who can be reinforced to crazy numbers and are really survivable? Do you want Chosen that are slightly slower? And do you want uh, Warriors who are just going to hold objectives incredibly well? Okay, that's the that's the big question that you want to ask yourself when you're dealing with all of these. Um, and they're all okay at holding objectives, but they have no strengths or weaknesses to do so. And so that's going to be really, uh, really based on killing the enemy, I think. Next up, we're going to look at the Chaos Chariot. This is a solo model with seven health and a four-up save that moves 10 inches. Uh, it's not very good in combat. It has some okay attacks with three attacks doing damage too. The reason you take this is because on the charge, it has the swift death ability where you'll do D3 mortal damage on the charge on a two-up. But it's probably not survivable enough for you to care about that, and it's not killy enough for you to care about it either. So I'm not really a big fan of the Chaos Chariot. Obviously, you can give it all of the keywords, but it's not for me. The slightly more powerful uh, chariot is the Gore Beast Chariot. It's got eight health with a four-up save, but doesn't move quite as far with nine inches and control value of two. It's got slightly more attack output thanks to the Gorby's Crushing Fist, which is four attacks, but they're fours and fours with zero rend and damage too. If you were to take this unit, you would take it for its brutal momentum ability, where when this unit uses the power through command, it inflicts an amount of mortal damage, uh, it inflicts an additional D3 mortal damage, sorry, uh, on a target and add three inches to the move you can make, which for a total of 12. But you probably won't be powering through with this model because you probably won't be taking it. Next unit we're going to look at are Ogroid Theradons. This is a unit of three, and much improved from their Age of Sigma 3 profile. Unit of three, monstrous infantry, although that's not obviously a keyword here. Uh, they just are infantry, that's what they actually are. And they have a musician and a standard bearer, so rallies are going to work on them, and they're going to do plus one to their control score, which means a unit of three for their control score is going to be a control score of six. Each model in the unit has got five health with a four-up save, and they move six inches. They have Goran weapons, which are four attacks each. Obviously, in Mark of Corn, that's going to be five attacks each for a total of 16 uh, attacks across the unit. Hitting on fours, which is sad, but we know if we take these guys with an Ogroid Mimrodon, then we can get uh, we can get plus one to hit on all of those attacks, or you can just use a command ability. They wound on twos. They're only rend one, which is probably the worst part about them. And then they have anti-infantry plus one rend, so that'll go to rend two. Uh, and they do damage two. Uh, and then they have plus one damage characteristic of these units, melee weapons for the rest of the turn, once per battle in any combat phase from Unleashed Savagery. So if you did take a reinforced unit of six of these guys, then and you'd made them have the mark of corn, then you would be doing 30 attacks, hitting on threes, wounding on twos, either rend one or rend two if you hit an infantry and damage three. It feels like a lot of attacks. It's not brute level attacks, which is obviously nutty, but it is a lot of attacks, and I think that's pretty good. Uh, so I really like this. Um, uh, I think this unit are good, uh, and they're fairly survivable. They got a four up save now. Uh, but obviously, probably Knights, Varangard, Chosen, all better because they have a three-up armor save. The next unit we're going to look at are Chaos Legionnaires. So they are one of the Warcry Warbands, which is now just a legit unit in uh, the book. Uh, you can't reinforce this unit, so that is what you can't do with a lot of the Warcry Warbands. Uh, now, there are eight models in this unit with one health each on a four-up armor save, and they move five inches. Um, uh, and then... They have the Darkon Weapons, which is two attacks, threes and fours, rend one, damage one. So it's not, they're not a very fighty unit. The reason you're going to take this unit, if you can take them for any reason, is because once per turn across the army, so you can't have multiple units of these doing it, they can do so confusion where you're picking an enemy unit within six inches of this unit to be the target, roll dice on a four plus, the target cannot use commands. And don't forget, you need a unit of Chaos Legionnaires to be able to improve the ability of Eternus. Uh, sorry, no, of uh, 
you need uh, you need this unit to improve the ability of Eternus, and this unit needs to be in combat, which is okay. Um, they're going to be a cheap unit, which is really beneficial to what they can do, and they do integrate with Eternus if that's what you want, uh, which is cool. Next up, we're going to look at the Chaos Spawn. It's got five health. These are single models of one. Five health, five up save, and moves 2d6 inches, which is pretty random. Uh, they can take any of the marks of Chaos, and in combat, they have freakish mutations, which is 2d6 attacks. They hit on fives, wound on fours. They do have crit two hits, though, which is pretty spicy. But they are a beast, as you can see down here. So they only have a control score as maximum of one. And they have a passive called Drawn to Power, where while this unit is holding within 12 inches of friendly Demon Prince that shares a mark of Chaos keyword with it, you can reroll the random characteristic rolls for this unit, move and attacks characteristic, which is kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> a host of spawn reroll and everything, but they hit on fives. So these are just useless, truth be told. Next unit we're going to look at are Dark Oath Savages, and that is another Warcry Warband. Therefore, it cannot be reinforced. The Dark Oath Savages, and Games Workshop had an opportunity to, to rename this unit, but didn't take it. It's a unit of 10, where each model of the unit is one health with a five up save. They move five inches, and they've got two attacks each, fours and threes, but they do have crit mortals, which is kind of spicy, in my opinion. 20 attacks from a unit of 10 with crit mortals. They do also have a special ability once per battle called Oath of Conquest, where if this unit is contesting an objective you control that is wholly within enemy territory, this unit has a five-up ward save for the rest of the battle, which is pretty fun, yeah, for the rest of the battle. But because you can't reinforce this to a unit of 20, therefore making it, because you can't reinforce the Warcry Warbands, making this have like a fun 40 attacks uh, that do crit mortals or... Uh, making a big wound pool with that five up ward save. I think they're not as good as if you were able to reinforce them. The next unit we're going to look at is sticking with our Marauders theme. And we're looking at the Dark Oath Fell Riders. They've got three health each on a five up save. And this is a unit of five cavalry that move 12 inches. So they're very fast. You can reinforce them to unit of 10 for 30 health, which is pretty good. You equip them with either Marauder Javelins or a broadsword. The Marauder Javelin will give each model in the unit one shot that it hits on a four, which is sad with no rend but his damage d3 the broadsword uh, and then in combat is two attacks fours and fours which is rubbish but rend one damage one the other opportunity is the broadsword where you don't get the shooting attack and instead you get two attacks fours and threes no rend damage one but you get plus one damage on the charge you have to be thanks to the passive swift attackers you're minus one to hit rolls for shooting attacks that target this unit and once per battle in any charge phase, you get to do the Oath of the Raider, where if this unit charges phase and is only in combat with one enemy unit, and that enemy unit is only in combat with this unit, you can add one to the Ren's characteristics, which is weapons, for the rest of the battle. Therefore, your Marauder Javelins would end up being uh, Ren 2 in combat. They're only going to be damage 1, but honestly, that feels pretty legit. Move up a unit of 10 Dark Oath Fell Riders, 12 inches, make 10 shots, which are damage D3, and then charge in and then have uh, tw uh, uh, 20 attacks, fours and fours, rend two, damage one. Doesn't feel awful, but like it doesn't feel incredible. It's not Varengard, obviously, uh, but pretty nice. They are also undivided as well, don't forget. So you got that plus one to wound against monsters or heroes. The next unit we're going to talk about are Dark Oath Marauders. This is a unit of 10 light infantry. Uh, which can be reinforced up to a unit of 20. They've got one health each for a unit of 10, and they've got a five-up save uh, and move five inches. Now, let's just quickly talk about all the buffs that you can put on these. A Dark Oath War Queen could give them a five-up ward save in your turn. If you take the Dark Oath uh, King, that's not his name, but you know the guy, the Dark Oath Leader chap, uh, then you'll get plus one attack uh, to this unit as well if you fight simultaneously with him. So that could be three attacks each because their weapon profile is like fine. It's two attacks, fours and threes, no rend, damage one. Uh, but you can improve their rend if once per battle in any charge phase, this unit charged this phase and the unmodified charge roll was an eight or more. So you could have 30 attacks from unit of 10, fours and threes, rend one. Uh, but obviously reinforce it, you could have 60 attacks. And then you've got Glorious Death where while this unit is holding within 12 inches of any friendly Dark Oath heroes, each time one of this unit is slain by combat attack that model was in combat with, roll a dice on a 5 plus, inflict a mortal wound back, mortal damage, sorry, back after the fight ability has been resolved. 
I think it's also worth noting as well that in the battle formation, you can bring this unit back at half strength uh, once it's been wiped out. So I think the idea is you just send in waves of these and then you resurrect them back. But, you know, that's all predicated on having heroes nearby who help, uh, you know, utilize them. And unfortunately, it really does feel like, you know, your big armor saves and your big face roll, like knights, Varangard, Bellacors are just that much better. I would really like seeing Dark Oath being in its own army, to be honest. That would have been like, you know, Stormcast Eternals versus Cities of Sigmar as a thing. The next unit we're going to look at is the Dark Oath World of Fiend. It's a beast with a, a, and a single model that can't be reinforced with 9 health and a 5 up save and no ward save. It moves 8 inches and it's got the flesh tearing more with 3 attacks, 3s and 3s, Ren 2 damage D3 and 6 attacks, 4s and 3s, Ren 1 damage 2. So it's okay in a fight. It has this ability, Feed on Flesh, which is a passive, where if any enemy models or friendly models are slain within 12 inches of this unit, you gain a sacrifice point up to a total of six. If you have two Wilder Fiends near the model that was slain, only one of them can benefit from the point. It's also a beast, so it's only going to count as one for controlling an objective. But it does have this special ability in your hero phase called Primal Sorcery, and it's all to do with those sacrifice points that you generate. You can choose one of three effects. The easiest one is Dark Might, where you'll heal three to this unit, where X is the number of sacrifice points. Which, you know, six six heals in your hero phase is pretty nice. You know, six health back on nine health is pretty nice, uh, legitimately. But it's only going to count for one for an objective, so I'm not bothered about it staying around. And it doesn't have an output to, like, punch through stuff. It's other two abilities is Mind Trial, where you pick an enemy within 12 inches and you roll all of the dice that you have for the sacrifice points. If any of those rolls are a five, then that target cannot use command points for the rest of the turn. That's a pretty big deal uh, to do, and you have to do a lot of things to make that happen compared to our unit of Dark Oath Savages, no, our Chaos Legionnaires, that are just going to pick a unit within six inches and do it on a four up anyway. Uh, so I'm not really sure about that. And then you have Warping Balefire, where you pick an enemy within 12 inches, you roll all your dice equal to your sacrifice points, and any three ups will do a mortal damage. Uh, so, you know, you're going to do four mortal damage to a unit within six inches. And this is only in your hero phase. So it's fine. I got to say I'm a little bit disappointed by this. Oh, he also has a five up ward save. Nine health, five up armor, five up ward save. I feel like I'm a little bit disappointed in this. I think he's okay. I'd like him to be super cheap, and then I would bring him as a supplement. But because he doesn't benefit other units in the army, and this is an army where it's all about supplemental buffs knocking onto each other for those extended effects, I feel like he doesn't integrate well. The Fumroy Crusher is uh, a single model, so for it can't be reinforced, with 8 health, 5 up save, and no ward save. Move 6 inches, and he's kind of got like a split profile where he has a shooting attack that's 12 inch range, D3 shots that do sadly hit on 4s, wound on a 2, red one damage 2, and the crushing fist and, and swinging masonry in combat, which is 6 attacks hitting on 4s, which is also sad, but it does have crit 2 hits, wounds on a 2, rend 1, damage D3. So I would say he's fine, but not great. The other one, so the other ability he has is Curse Destroyers, which you do once per turn in uh, the combat phase, in any combat phase, so every combat phase. And it's called Curse Destroyers. You pick a terrain feature within one inch of this unit and then pick each other unit, friendly or and enemy, within three inches of that terrain feature to be the targets. Roll a D3 for each target, and on a two up, you fit to the number of mortal damage on the target equal to the roll. Now, it's not necessarily the best ability in the world, but I do love the concept that if your opponent is trapped around a piece of terrain, you just yeet this guy forward, maybe out of a, a gaunt summoner, charge in, and then rampage, because rampage is going to happen before anyone swings, and then just do a ton of mortal damage to literally everything you can see, right? That seems so... Actually, in the right, very specific scenario, he could be amazing. Only one can do that a turn. I just want to be clear. The idea of blowing up all the terrain all the time is pretty funny, but only one can do it per turn. The next unit that we're going to look at is a Mind Stealer Spheranx. It's got 10 health and a 5 up save, so it's not super survivable, but it's got a control value of 5, which is really nice for grabbing those objectives and is also fast, movement 10. It's got 6 attacks, which are 4s and 4s damage too, which isn't super impressive, but it does have a unique war scroll called Dominate the Mind, which is done once per turn again in the army. So if you've got multiple units, so you can only do it the one time, and it's done in any combat phase, which does be in every combat phase, you pick an enemy unit within 6 inches of this unit to be the target. Let's be clear. 
Pick an enemy unit within six inches of this unit to be the target. It doesn't need to be in combat to do it. Roll a dice. If the roll exceeds the target's control characteristic, which is normally incredibly low, the target has strike last for the rest of the time, rest of the turn. So that's the second, third source of strike last. Third source of strike last that we have in this army. Amazing stuff. Uh, is it? Are you going to be able to fit all those tools in? Who knows? It's really fast, so you can keep up. You can keep, have this unit keep up with a unit of knights or Varangard, which is really good, uh, but really cool. The Mutant Vortex Beast is a single monster. You can't reinforce it. It's got 14 health with a 4-up save, and it moves 10 inches, and is also a control value of 5. So it's going to be great for contesting an objective. In combat, he's fine. With 4 attacks, 4s four and 2s, four, uh, rend 1 damage, D3, which is not super impressive. And then the potential to called Claw is 12 attacks, 4s and 4s, but it does have crit auto wound. So good for holding an objective and survivability is okay. However, thank, in any hero phase, thanks to the mutant regeneration ability, you're going to be able to heal D3 to this unit. Don't forget, if you go and take that command trait that we talked about earlier, you can also heal three in every hero phase as well. So that's going to be a total of healing three plus D3 so far in every hero phase. And then he has a really cool rampage once per turn in the army. So it's a bit sad sad because you can't have multiple uh, mutilous vortex beasts, or as I like to call them, the MVB, in a list, but you can have one do this awesome, cool ability in every combat phase. In the, it's the Aura of Mutation, and you pick a visible enemy unit within 12 inches of the, this unit to be the target. Again, you don't need to be in combat to do this ability. You roll a dice and apply the corresponding effect below. If this unit is wholly within 12 inches of a Zinch wizard, then you'll get to roll two dice and pick your favorite. Uh, so... Number one, if you roll all the result, then no effect. On a two, you subtract three from the target's control score till the start of your next turn, okay? On a three, the target cannot use commands for the rest of the turn. Pretty nice. On a four, subtract one from the target's move characteristic for the rest of the battle. That's pretty nice. On a five, inflict D6 mortal damage on the target, which is pretty big. Then heal D6 to this unit, which will make this unit potentially heal every turn three plus d3 plus d6 and then finally if you roll a six you get to pick any effect so if you're near a zinch wizard you're going to roll t two dice and any fives or sixes is going to do a guaranteed d6 mortal damage to a unit within 12 inches uh, which feels pretty nice in my opinion but it is sad that they don't make spawn anymore i agree Chaos Furies are a unit of six. They've got one health each and a six-up save. They are not very survivable. Uh, they also have a six-up ward save, though, which is pretty fun, the little demons. Uh, <laughs> they've got three attacks each for a total of 18 attacks at the unit, which is fours and fours, and it's got rend, and it's got damage one. So maybe really good for potentially hitting a unit. Uh, if you could be reinforced, you could even potentially have 12. That's a lot of attacks, uh, to be honest, if you're trying to kill like a backline character. Well, how are you going to get there? Well, they're movement 12, and they have this special ability called Sneaky Little Devils, which you do in any combat phase. If this unit is in combat, you roll a dice, and on a 3-up, this unit can immediately use the retreat abilities if it were your movement phase without any mortal damage being inflicted. So, move them up 12 inches, charge 2d6, potentially charge 3d6, then move on a three up, move them, and because they have the fly keyword, move over enemy units, be at the back of the board, threatening maybe even a terrain feature uh, in the later turns, which is pretty spicy. So I think these Furies could be really good for utility in a very elite army. Raptorix are a beast unit that is a unit of six with two health each for each model and a six up armor save. They move 10 inches and they have three attacks each, fours and fours, no rend damage one for a pretty okay profile. They're beasts, so they're not going to be very helpful holding objectives. And they have an ability called Crazed Flock, where if they've charged that turn, you add one to their damage characteristics. You do not need another unit that is going to run up the board and hit stuff because you already have that. And you do not need a unit that is lightly armored and doesn't control objectives. You have loads of other choices in this book to do something different. So Fury is significantly better because they have a role and the Raptrix have no role at all. The next unit we're looking at is a Slaughter Brute, which is a large monster. It's got 14 health with a 4-up save and a control value of 5, which is quite nice. It's got movement 10, so it's definitely going to be able to get into combat. 
uh, and be pretty quick, especially thanks to its sigils of domination ability, which you use in the deployment phase. You choose a friendly Saves the Darkness hero with this un- uh, within this unit's combat range to be this unit's master. Then, for the rest of the battle, while this unit is within this master's combat range, you add one to the number of dice rolled when making charges. So this is going to be a amazing... This is so good. Sigils of Domination is great. Big charge. Throw the big monster in. Don't forget now, there's loads of ways to get 3d6 charges in this army, which is good. Strike last and stuff. Is it any good in combat? Eight attacks, hitting on fours, wound on twos, rend one, plus one rend against uh, infantry, and is damage two. And then two attacks, which are damage three. So the answer is no, not really. So hopefully he's super cheap. <laughs> and then, but he does have a rampage called Rampage in Charge, which you do in any charge phase. And if you have multiple models of this, uh, you can only do it the one time because of that once per turn army uh, you know, restriction. If this unit charge, pick a unit with an inch, roll a D3 on a two up, do that many mortal damage. And if it's infantry... You double it. I feel like I'm kind of repeating myself on some of these rampages in these reviews, but ultimately, that's what they are. Uh, so he does about as much damage on the charge as a Mega Gargan. Uh, but this Lord of Prue, unless he's super cheap, he's rubbish, and just don't bother Just don't bother picking this up. The next unit is another monster, and it is a Soul Grinder with 16 health on a 4-up save and a 6-up ward save. It's fairly survivable. Control 5 for grabbing an objective is pretty nice, and move 10, and it's even faster than it seems, thanks to the implacable advanced passive, where this unit can use charge uh, abilities even if it ran. So it's got run and charge, which is super nice. And then it's also got a rampage when it does get into combat, where you pick an enemy infantry unit in combat with this unit, So infantry unit, and on a 2+, plus, you do that many mortal wounds, so up to 6 mortal wounds. Then it can make a 6-inch move, and during that move, it can pass through models in the target unit, but must end that move in combat. So this thing can go super fast, right? Super, super fast, in my opinion. Now, uh, in combat, it's got 8 attacks that do damage D3, but it is let down by hitting on 4s. And the Hellforge Claw has 1 attack that does D6 damage, but it is a crit mortal. So if you do roll a 6 then you're going to do D6 more damage, which is pretty decent. And it's got a couple of shooting attacks as well. One that's 12-inch range that does three damage and another one uh, that's got six attacks uh, that does one damage. Neither of those, though, have shoot into combat. So when this, once this guy gets locked into combat and seeing as he's on a dinner plate-sized base, he's definitely going to get into combat. I think he's fun and engaging, and I like the idea of just sending this guy forward, but he's not going to do a massive amount of reliable damage when he gets there. So if you did like uh, Brand's gang, uh, then you can take them with uh, the Oathsworn Kin, which is a little unit. So it's Singri Brand, Gunner Brand, and the Oathsworn Kin as a singular unit. And what's really fun about the Oathsworn Kin is they've got three models in the unit with three health each on a five-up armor save. So that's quite, quite a lot of like wounds for this kind of unique little unit. Uh, They've also, two of the models have got four attacks each in combat, fours and threes, no rend, but damage two for some reason. Uh, Like, (laughs) an Iron Jaws pig isn't isn't damage two. Uh, Sorry, an Iron Jaws uh, who's mounted on a pig isn't damage two. Uh, They've also got crit mortals. So, I don't know, eight attacks, crit mortal, two damage is fine. Uh, And then the Gnarled Staff, uh, which is... uh, used by Broken Nadia is three attacks, damage D3. If you do have Broken Nadia in the unit, which is one of the three named models, then you get Wizard Level 1. And if you do have the Wizard Level 1, uh, then you can cast your own spell, uh, or this unit's spell, in the hero phase or the enemy hero phase and it's cast on a five and it's called withering death you pick a visible enemy hero within 18 inches of this unit to be the target and you inflict one mortal damage on the target and you subtract one from the attacks characteristic of the target's melee weapons and that is honestly not a bad little spell minus one to the attacks characteristics especially with like some seasonal rules to be able to reduce the attacks characteristics down that feels really great so that's it for the review Let's do a conclusion, shall we? And let's see what we think. I think especially later in the review, we started to just see some units which are really difficult to balance with the incredibly strong units that we saw earlier in the book. The spell law is great. 
That is undeniable. And I feel like that ability to heal three on monsters in an aura felt more and more impressive the further we got into the book. That said, I feel like there's a variety of different ways to build this. I feel like you can definitely play Archeon with a bunch of other units. And I feel like playing with something like Archeon is actually an incredibly high skill cap thing. Of course you want to go take the big man himself, but actually because it's normally all of your resources in one place, you have to normally play really cleverly to get around the board in the right, uh, like at the right time. I will argue though, that thanks to counter charge being new in Age of Sigmar 4, you're going to be able to get into lots more places that previously maybe you wouldn't be able to do with Archeon. There's also a lot of healing to keep him up. So put Archeon to the side, and I think that there's definitely just an Archeon build. If we move over to Bellacore, I feel like Bellacore is the best unit in Age of Sigmar 4. I'm just going to put that out there. So two cast wizard when you want as many casts as you can, thanks to manifestations being out there on the board. He's got the ability to make three units strike first in your opponent's turn, which is insane, including himself. Has also, uh, you know, got that dark mastery ability, which you've got to do a lot to make up for. And its spell is also great. I think Bellacoy is so, so impactful in the game in my personal opinion. Uh, and then obviously Bellacore could double up with a bunch of other units, maybe a Braxia if you wanted to. I think there's also like an Abraxia Varangard build as well. I think you just always start with Bellacore and then you build the rest of the list unless you're doing Archeon. Uh, then you just had all of these really fun characters and heroes that combine for, you know, like an Ogroid Mimrodon with Ogroid Theradons. And they do this combination charge, which is nice because you've got all these ways to make Strike Last happen, which is quite interesting. Then we started getting down into the infantry like the marauder stuff and it didn't quite have that same punch it didn't have the survivability and it didn't have the punch but maybe that's what that sub faction is for where you can recycle them and bring them back on the board it's a lot of models to paint to lose them to bring them back on the board so we'll have to see if that ends up being effective the one thing i will say is i wasn't super impressed by the ability to have massive control scores uh, or even reduce control scores or even positively affect control scores there are a couple of ways to do that and we have talked about loads of different units and all the buffs you can stack, but it is eventually all going to cost points. And that is something you're going to have to be conscious of. So we're going to make another video where when the points come out. They actually came out in the middle of recording this video. Uh, and then we'll be making more videos. We'll be doing tier list videos. We're doing loads of stuff to do with Slaves to Darkness. Uh, but I got to say, it feels like, you know, a few books in, feels like easily one of the strongest ones we've looked at, but also maybe one of the most diverse. But maybe that's just because it's got loads of different units. I also want to compliment Games Workshop here. I think there's a couple of units that are a bit nothing burgers. Uh, so I'm going to, you know, uh, take a shot at that. But I'm also going to say that lots of the units did something different to the other unit. It wasn't, in some cases, it wasn't just a copy and paste. Like, they all had a reason to do so. And I think the fact that we have strike last and then being able to counter charge a hero and another unit in at the same time is actually really cool and i love that so i think that's fun so congratulations to them and i hope you enjoyed the video like comment subscribe leave a review uh share it with your friends please join my patreon to help support me make more content thanks very much and i'll see you soon